and it is time. It's time to get started. Officially welcome everyone to Digital Earth Academy Extremes. We're so excited to have you here. In just a moment, I will introduce you to our our host and narrator, uh, Bob Reynolds, who is a geologist and a research associate, and our pilot, Asa um, Erlinson is his last name. But before we begin, I just want to start today by acknowledging that the Denver Museum of Nature and Science is on the traditional lands of the Cheyenne, Ute, Arapaho, and Ocheti Shikoan nations, and that lands all over the planet Earth uh, have been and continue to be stewarded by indigenous people. Also, I want to welcome you from all over our country watching us today. It's so exciting to have you here. Now throughout the program, there are two ways you'll be able to interact with us. One is there will be some polls throughout the show that you'll be able to vote in. And the other is the chat. And you won't see each other's chats, but I'll see them and I will keep an eye on it. So if you have any questions during the show, put them in the chat and we'll save them for the end. And then without further ado, I would like to introduce Bob Reynolds and Asa Erlinson. There they are. And let's fly off into the space. Well, thank you very much, Mitch. Welcome to uh, Digital Earth Academy. And uh, we're going to start a program here. We're going to tour the entire Earth, and we're going to be looking at the extreme places. And what does extreme mean? We were trying to figure out how to describe that word. And it means if you think about the most, so the highest possible place, the hottest possible place, what does it mean? And if you think about, <laughs> we can think about the words that end in EST. So coldest, hottest, highest, pointiest, those kinds of things. We're going to be looking at the most extreme places on the surface of the earth. And we're going to do a world tour. And at the very end, we're actually going to leave the earth and look up into space. Let's get started. You might recognize what we're looking at right here. It's a great big building located next to City Park in Denver, Colorado, for those of you who are in Colorado. Many of you will have been here. This is our museum. We're looking at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and we're going to pull back out, and Asa is going to fly us. We're using something called Open Space, which is a product produced by NASA, funded by NASA, and we're blasting out into space, and we're going to go up to the north, and we're heading to a place that's got some very interesting and extreme environments up in Wyoming. It's a big national park, our first national park in northwestern Wyoming. It begins with a Y. Some of you might be guessing which one it is. Which national park do you think we're headed to? And there's a great big lake there, and it's Yellowstone National Park. Exactly right. I see you guys got it right in the, in the chat. So we're going to look at a couple of spots in Yellowstone, and Yellowstone has some very extreme places. Some of you might have been there, and if you haven't been there yet, it's certainly a place that you should travel to soon because it's not too far away from Denver. We're going to come down in. You can see sort of some whitish, whitish blotches there. Those are places where there's geothermal activity, hot water, there's mud pots, there's all kinds of very strange things. And one of the most famous geysers in the whole world is right here, the famous geyser. It's an extremely tall geyser, and it's very faithful. It blasts off about every hour on schedule, and there you go, you've got it. It's old faithful. We might be able to see a picture of it from the side. It's a very beautiful geyser. If you look at it from above, it doesn't really show up very impressively because it's really just a big, broad, white area with a parking lot around it. We can Let's go back to our open space view. Here you go. And you can see the big parking lot and then Old Faithful's right smack in the middle of that scene. But let's look for some more interesting features in Yellowstone. We're going to go to one of the big hot springs that's very easy to get to, and it's called the Grand Prismatic Spring. Some of you might have seen it. Let's see what it looks like from above. Ace is flying us up just a little bit to the north, and we're going to get to the Grand Prismatic Spring, which is a beautiful sight to see. So it's an extremely unusual feature, and it's located a little bit further north. And it's got um, very bright colors, and it's got some very interesting organisms, including cyanobacteria, there you go, that live in the hot waters, and they're called extremophiles. These are organisms that live in the super hot waters of the hot spring systems, and they give it some of the brilliant colors that you can see. We're going to come right down in from above, and then we're going to get a quick view on the ground. But stand by, we're coming in from above. This is Grand Prismatic Spring 
in Yellowstone National Park. And it's certainly a beautiful sight to see. The, it's deep and blue in the center. And then the waters come up on the edges and the algae and the bacteria live in the shallow waters on the edges and give it its dramatic colors. And you can walk right up to this thing on a boardwalk. And uh, let's see if we've got a quick view of what it looks like when you're there on the ground. So there's a view from the side and you can see the boardwalk in the distance and you walk right up next to this feature an extremely unusual feature. And uh, this is the Grand Prismatic Spring. So it's a fabulous spot and something that you can all get to and visit. Now, we are looking at Yellowstone Park and Yellowstone is an unusual place with it's got an extremely large number of geysers and hot springs and mud pots. And it's got one of the greatest concentration of these features in the whole world. And it's because it's sitting on top of a buried volcano. Deep underneath Yellowstone, there's hot magma. And when you come up to the surface, you can see these hot springs and geysers up at the surface. The hot magma is still underground. But let's go to a place where the hot magma is actually coming up onto the surface. And we're gonna leave Yellowstone National Park. We're gonna back out a little bit, getting a little tour of North America here. As we move to the east, we're gonna cross all of Canada. You can see the Great Lakes. You can see Newfoundland. You can see we've got Greenland coming in. That's the big white thing on the north. But we're going to go to this little island that's just to the east side of Greenland. And what's the name of this island? Let's see if you guys can figure out the name of this island we're coming down into. I see it. People have figured it out. You guys are really good. So we're coming down onto Iceland. Seems to be more ice over on Greenland than there is on Iceland, but that's another story. We're going to come down to what's called the Reykjanes Peninsula, which is the southern edge of Iceland. And it's quite, quite near the capital. The capital of Iceland is Reykjavik. And we're coming down onto the Reykjanes Peninsula. And this is a place where there's just recently been a volcanic eruption. So in Yellowstone, we talked about the magma that's just underground. Well, here in Iceland, the magma has come up to the surface and has erupted out. And it's a little bit hard to see using these satellite images because these images were taken before the volcano erupted. The volcano just erupted about a month ago. And some of you might've heard about it in the news. We're going to zoom in to about the location, and then we're going to switch to a video of the volcano. So stand by. It's in this rugged ground here on Iceland. And again, it's not too hard to get to Iceland. Some of you might be able to get there. They have direct flights from Denver to Iceland. It's a place that has all kinds of wonderful bird life and beautiful natural features to see, including, of course, volcanoes. So we're going to come down in and let's see if we can pull right about this spot is where the volcano erupted. And let's see if we can pull up that video. So there, this is what it looked like about oh, 10 days ago. And this is video from RUV, which is the Icelandic public television program. So these are publicly available images of the erupting volcano in Iceland, taken just a few weeks ago. And the people from Reykjavik, the capital city, were walking out here across the plains to get to this volcano, and they were roasting hot dogs over those lava flows. That's what I've heard, at least. And I've been to Iceland, and I'll say that one of the challenges is that there's not a lot of sticks in Iceland, so they would have had to bring their own sticks to roast their hot dogs over these hot lava flows. But you can see the burbling lava. It's extremely hot. And it's forming new crust, it's new land is forming today in Iceland. And all of Iceland is a volcanic island. Uh, some of you might know it's part of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge system. And it's a place where the volcanoes are very, very active. And there's eruptions in Iceland uh, every few years. And if you go to Iceland, you'll see lots and lots of evidence of volcanic eruptions. So, the lava is glowing because it's so hot. Somebody was asking why the lava is glowing. It's super, super hot. And as things get hotter and hotter, they glow. They emit radiation, which is visible. Now we're going to leave Iceland and we are going to go to another extremely interesting place. We're going to go to Africa and we're going to look for some extremely interesting features in Africa. 
And I've done a lot of work in Africa. I'm a geologist and I've done lots of work in Africa and uh, geologists study rocks, but we also study environments and we've studied the lakes in Africa. And we're gonna look at a particularly extreme lake in Kenya, the country is Kenya, and the lake is named Lake Magadi. So we're coming down into East Africa and the big lake in the middle is Lake Victoria. And we're gonna come down just between Lake Victoria and the big mountain on the lower right is Mount Kilimanjaro. That's the highest mountain in Africa. It's extremely high, but we're gonna see some higher ones. And now we're gonna be looking for Lake Magadi, which is a relatively small lake, but it's extremely interesting. And it's right near the border between Kenya and Tanzania. And this lake, which is that strange shaped feature right in front of you, you can see some reddish color in it. We're gonna go in and more closely look at that reddish color. And it's a very strange situation. The chemistry of this lake is very unusual. It has in incredible concentrations of, of potash and it forms crusts. And then the crusts get very uh, kinds of algae that grow in them. And the algae is pink colored. And a lot of, uh, there's also brine shrimp in here and the flamingos come and eat the brine shrimp. And as many of you know, the flamingos are reddish color. And we think that some of the color in the flamingos is coming from what they're eating, which are the pink brine shrimp in these lakes. And Ace is gonna take us in a little bit closer and you'll see some extremely bizarre textures in the surface of the water here uh, in Lake Magadi. So this is Lake Magadi in Kenya. And it's a very strange place indeed. I've been there and it's super hot and they're making potash uh, for fertilizer and uh, it's a dusty kind of place and there's a big chemical factory and it's extremely bizarre. The potash hangs in sort of stalactites from the ceiling because it's in the dust in the air. Whenever there's any moisture, it precipitates out and it makes crusts and stalactites all over the place. So here is Lake Magadi in, in Kenya. And it's, uh, the, it's in part of the Rift Valley system. And the Rift Valley system in Kenya extends uh, across the entire country. And we're gonna follow the rift. We're gonna go up uh, through Kenya, up to the north. And we're gonna be looking for a place where there's the most extreme acidic conditions on the face of the earth. So we're gonna work our way up through Kenya here a little bit slowly. We can see the Rift Valley and it's the, called the East African Rift. And it's the place where the world is pulling apart and there's lots of volcanic activity. There's Lake Turkana in the North on the top of the screen. And we've got the Horn of Africa on the right-hand side of the screen, that would be Somalia. And we're gonna go down into Ethiopia. We're gonna go right down into this area that's called the Danakil Depression. It's extremely hot and extremely low, and there's volcanic activity. Again, the world is pulling apart here. The red hot magma is coming up. These are active volcanoes, and it's a wonderful example of geological forces that you can see from above. And you guys can do some of this at home. You can use Google Earth to travel to some of these places using your computers at home. But we're now in Ethiopia and in Eritrea. Uh, we're in the Danakil Depression. It's called, it's below sea level. And we're gonna look at the most acidic place on the whole surface of the earth. It's a little volcanic feature here. Uh, not very many people live here. There's a little ghost town. It's called Dalol. It's super hard to get here, extremely difficult to get here. It turns out you have to rent a camel to get to Dalol. You can't even, there's no roads anymore. There's just uh, trails and you rent a camel and you get there by camel. And I haven't been there yet, but I hope to go here someday soon. You can see the colors are really bizarre, a little bit like what we saw in Yellowstone. There's some of those uh, strange greens and browns. And this is an extremely acidic place. This is the most acidic place on the surface of the earth. So acid means it's very corrosive. And we're gonna go right down in and look at it. And I want you to think about what the effects of acid might be on, for example, on the human body. So be thinking about that. But we're gonna be looking right now at this place called Dalol, Ethiopia. 
and it is an extremely bizarre place. I think we've got a photograph taken on the ground of what Dalol looks like. You'll see the yellows and brown colors very distinctly. So we've, there is a, a ground photograph, but it, um, there you go. You can see what it looks like up close. It looks a little bit like some of the hot springs in Yellowstone National Park. So you'll see some features like this in Yellowstone, but in this in Dalol, it's extremely bizarre. Exactly, someone's saying it looks super odd. And the color is amplified by bacteria. Yep, I see that in the chat. So we're going to think about now, what is the effect of acidic conditions on ourselves? What does acid do to maybe pieces of humans? Let's see if we can find a video that was put together by Mitch and Asa, our museum uh, experience coordinators. And uh, let's see what we've got. Hello, everyone. Welcome to one of the Denver Museum of Nature and Sciences Science Labs. Today, we're going to do some experiments about what would happen to the human body in some of Earth's most acidic environments. In particular, we're going to look at what would happen to the hardest part of the human body, the teeth. And you're probably wondering, where did I get this bag of human teeth? Well, where else am I going to get it from? I got it from the tooth fairy. That's right, the tooth fairy. And we had permission to use these teeth from their previous owner. These are from our friend Rohana. She lost them as a baby, but grew new ones, so she doesn't need these anymore. Wow, thanks, Tooth Fairy. Anytime. If you have a need, wait, did you hear that? Somebody just lost a tooth and put it underneath a pillow. I must be off. Goodbye. Okay, thanks, Tooth Fairy. To simulate some of the hyperacidic pools in Dalal, Ethiopia, we have some hydrochloric acid. But first, let's see what would happen to your teeth in some more common acids. Here we have orange juice, a carbonated cola, vinegar, and water for a control. One way to measure how acidic something is is with the pH scale. Water is at seven, right in the middle. The lower the numbers are, the more acidic they are. We can test this with litmus paper. When you dip litmus paper in a substance, it changes color and telling you how acidic it is. You can see that the orange juice is kind of yellowy orange. And the cola is a teensy bit redder than the orange juice. And the vinegar, which is actually a cleaning vinegar, so it's more acidic than normal vinegar, is a little more pink. Next, we measure the teeth on a very, very sensitive scale so we can figure out exactly how much they corrode in the acid. Finally, it's time to put the teeth in the acids and begin our experiment. And then we wait. So our teeth have been soaking overnight in the acids. Now we get them out of the acids, we'll dry them off a little bit, and then we'll weigh them. And finally, we get our results. All of our measurements are in grams. We see that the tooth that was in water changed mass by about 0%. That's what we expected. The tooth that was in vinegar lost about 12%. The tooth that was in cola lost about 16%. And the tooth that was in orange juice lost about 10% of its mass. Now, this is just one experiment, and all of our teeth had different starting weights. To get really accurate numbers, we'd have to do this over and over again with lots and lots of different teeth. But these preliminary results suggest that the acid that's worst for your teeth, cola. Also, look at that tooth. It looks worse than the other teeth in a couple of different ways. Maybe there's something else in cola that's bad for your teeth. It's sugar, which comes in many forms, like high fructose corn syrup. Beware! But now it's time for the main event, the hydrochloric acid. So now let's check the pH of our hydrochloric acid. It is much redder than our other acids, much more acidic. In fact, to test this, I think we're going to need a bigger tooth. This is an adult molar donated by our curator of space sciences, Dr. Kachun Yu. Now we begin our experiment. We take the tooth, we put it into our scientific glassware, and we pour the hydrochloric acid over it. Now we've actually diluted the acid to about 40%, so it's safer to work with, but it's still extremely acidic. You can see the reaction is already taking place. We actually set up a time-lapse camera to watch this tooth overnight. <laughs> Now it's time to check our results. Let's see how much of this tooth is left. 
and here it is. It looks much smaller. To figure out exactly how much smaller, let's compare it to the before tooth. As you can see, the crown is almost entirely gone and the roots are much, much smaller. Now all that's left is to weigh our tooth and get our final results. In 40% hydrochloric acid, our tooth decayed by over 70%. That means it's less than one third the size it was before. Wow, hydrochloric acid. Pretty intense and scary. But did you know you actually have some hydrochloric acid with you right now? Yeah, in your tummy. That's right, hydrochloric acid is one of the main components of stomach acid that our bodies use to break down the food that we eat. But don't worry, your stomach lining protects the rest of your body from this dangerous acid. Just, you know, try not to swallow any of your teeth. Leave them under your pillow instead, where they belong. Tooth fairy away! Wow, Mitch and Asa, that was an extremely interesting video. <laughs> Wonderful to see that. And uh, those acidic conditions, which you see in the lab, actually exist right here on Earth. So if you were to drop organic material into that Dalal volcanic feature in Ethiopia, it would dissolve. But let's look at some other extremely interesting places on Earth. We're going to look at the extreme high places. And what do you guys think about the highest place? clue at the beginning of the presentation in the photograph that was behind Mitch. Some of you might have guessed that one. So we're going to go on a tour of some of the extremely high points. And again, the geography here, we're leaving the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. We're crossing the Arabian Peninsula. We're going across Iran and we're going to cross Afghanistan. We're coming up into northern Pakistan. And we're going to look at one of the extremely high mountains in the world. In fact, the second highest mountain on the whole mountain chain here, which is called the Himalayas. And we're going to come into northern Pakistan, up near the Chinese border. And it's also a little bit near the border of India. So it's a little bit of a complicated place in terms of who is controlling the ground. And it's very inhospitable up here. It's extremely rugged. As you can see, the mountaintops are covered in snow. That's the white stuff. And there are glaciers that feed off of some of these mountains. And we're going to be looking for the mountain that's called K2 which is the second highest mountain in the whole world. And one of the things we'll see is its shadow. You can see there's a dark shadow right in there, triangular. And it does, it looks a little bit like powdered sugar on the tops of those mountains, but this is snow. And these mountains are extremely high, over 20,000 feet high. And see how rugged they are. You can see that they're, they're very steep and jaggedy and the peaks are very sharp. And uh, there's some extremely sharp cliffs. And of course, it's very, very difficult to climb these mountains. And they're very dangerous, extremely dangerous to climb. But many people have worked up climbing uh, K2, which is the peak right here in the foreground. And some of you might have heard of Greg Mortensen. He's the fellow that wrote the book called Three Cups of Tea. And he was on an expedition near K2 and became lost on the Baltoro Glacier. And he was found by some villagers who took him in uh, because he was getting very cold and had run out of food. And the villagers were very kind to Greg Mortensen. They took him in and uh, he decided that he was gonna help them by building schools, especially schools for girls, because in Northern Pakistan and parts of Afghanistan, there are no schools for girls. And so they have a program now, uh, which is building schools for girls. And if you wanna read about it, there's a wonderful book called Three Cups of Tea. And that happens right in this area, right next to K2. Look how steep it is, how jagged it is. And this is an extremely rugged country. Now we're going to go a little bit. Oh, there's a beautiful view of it from the bottom. You can see how extremely hard that would be to climb up on the K2. But let's go and look at some other mountains in the Himalayan chain. And we're going to be moving towards the east. We're going to look at the entire Himalayan mountain range. And uh, there's a lot of territory here. We're leaving Pakistan. We're coming into what would be parts of uh, Tibet uh, and parts of Northern India and parts of Nepal. And we're gonna come in to, we've crossed Nepal there 
And the long arcuate chain there is the Himalaya Mountains. And we're looking for the tallest mountain in the Himalaya Mountains, which is the tallest mountain on Earth. And you guys have gotten it right. That's right. We're coming in. And this mountain sits on the border between Nepal and China. And part of it is in China and part of it is in Nepal. And people can climb it from either side, but this is a very, very hard mountain to climb. And we're coming down into Mount Everest. There you got it right. And we are going to see what Mount Everest looks like first from above. And then we'll look at it a little bit from the side. You can see from above that it's got a whole series of white tongues of ice that are feeding off of the high mountains. These are glaciers. And the glaciers are coming out. They're carrying ice and rock away from Mount Everest. They're flowing. They move every day. And sometimes there's extremely dangerous avalanches and ice falls on these glaciers. And if you read about people who climb up Mount Everest, one of the challenges is that they've got to climb up these glaciers. And there's some very dangerous ice fall areas where the ice is unstable and the people have to cross the ice and they sometimes lose their lives. Here's a view of Mount Everest from the side. You can see people climbing up along that knife edge ridge and they're climbing up towards the summit of Mount Everest, the highest mountain in the world. You can also see on the left-hand side, some stripes in the rocks and it's sedimentary rock. Mount Everest is made up of sedimentary rock and there's actually fossilized seashells up on the top of Mount Everest. And that's because the, mount, the rocks in the Himalaya mountains have been lifted up high by the forces of the collision of India with Asia that's made the Himalaya Malaya Mountains, and it's lifted the sedimentary rock up into the high skies, putting them up in extreme altitudes. I think we've got a little video of what it looks like if we're down at a camp near Mount Everest. Let's see what it looks like from the ground. Here we are, and we can see Mount Everest in the distance with the snow blowing off the top. You see the snow plume on the top of Mount Everest, and you can see the glaciers coming off of it, and you can see some meltwater there. The glaciers are melting. It's getting a little bit warmer. The glaciers are melting, but you can see how extremely rugged the landscape is. And this is all in an altitude where you have to bring everything with you. There's no food up here. The, the water has to be purified and everything is carried on the backs of people and on the backs of yaks. So they get parades of yaks that carry material up here when you go hiking in the Himalayas. And then as you get super high up, you have to carry everything in your backpack. It's extremely difficult and very, very, very rugged and dangerous. So we're seeing these extreme environments in terms of the heights. And uh, let's see if we can find some extremely low areas. And uh, I invite you to think about, we're going to go back to the United States. We can sort of take a little bit of a tour here, heading back to the United States. And what do you think the, the extreme lowest area is in the United States? And it's also the extreme hottest area. So be thinking about that. I'm seeing some answers are coming in. I'm seeing some answers. So we're going to back out from the Himalaya Mountains. We're going to be, you can see Southeast Asia. We're going to go across China. We're going to go across the biggest ocean in the world. That great big ocean. What's the name of the biggest ocean in the world? It's a very big ocean. It's got Hawaii sitting in the middle. We're crossing right over the top of Hawaii. And there you go, we across the Pacific Ocean. And we're coming down into Western United States. And we're gonna be in a desert in the, um, near the border between Nevada and California. We're gonna look at the lowest place in the United States. And we're gonna be looking for the hottest place in the United States. And we're thinking about temperatures now. And, uh, I'd invite you guys to think about when you've been the hottest in your life, because we're going to be coming down into a super hot desert here. And when have you guys been the hottest in your life? So some of you will have been maybe in a desert. You might have been sitting in the sun somewhere. And think about when you were the hottest you've ever been. And I'm seeing there some people think you were the hottest Last year, near the heater, you were the hottest. <laughs> some people were super hot in New Mexico. Well, some people were super hot in Hawaii. Well, we're coming down into Death Valley. And you can see the shape of the valley here. It's a great big trough. There's not a lot of vegetation. And 
The bottom is below sea level. You can see there's some salt accumulating in here and it is the hottest place in the world. It gets to be 130 degrees Fahrenheit. And there's been some discussion about whether that temperature was really recorded correctly and whose thermometer was it recorded on. But this place has the record for the highest temperature in the world and certainly the highest temperature in the United States. And if you were to go here in the summertime, you'd wanna take a lot of drinking water with you. This is a very tough place. And I've worked on the geology here because the geology is beautifully exposed and uh, it's a fantastic place to see, but you've gotta be careful if you go in the summertime. We're coming down into the place where the lowest part is, and it's got a name that's interesting. It's called bad water. Some of you have asking if humans can survive here, and humans can definitely survive here. Uh, if you go, actually, if you look closely, you'll find archaeological evidence. People did live here in the past. Here people are today. You can see you can go visit as a tourist, uh, and it's super hot, but you can walk out and you can look at the salt, the salt crusts at bad water. But I've looked around here and you can find uh, archeological evidence. People did live here in the past and there's mountain sheep that live here. And I think the people who lived here in the past were hunting mountain sheep. Uh, there's a kind of mountain sheep that lives on the edges of Death Valley. So this is the place where you might say that you could be the hottest you've ever been if you come to Death Valley. And now we're gonna ask you to think about the other extreme. So we're gonna think about where you might've been extremely cold. So where have you guys been cold? If you think about it, you know, was it in winter time? Was it a time when you forgot your jacket? Was there a time when you were watching a sporting event and you were outside and it rained on you? When were you extremely cold? So tell me a little bit about your, uh, experiences about being extremely cold. And we're gonna to go to the coldest place on earth. So if somebody says they were cold in a blizzard, you were cold when you were in a snowstorm in Texas. Well, the coldest place on earth is at the South Pole. And we're gonna back out now. Again, we're gonna do a tour of the world. You're gonna see Southern California, Baja California, the Gulf of California, we're crossing Mexico. And we're gonna be going South across Central America. We're going to turn the world on its end, and we're going to look at Antarctica, the South Pole. You can see it's entirely covered in ice, and it's a place that's extremely inhospitable. It means it's, you don't find any food here. There's no shelter. If you go to Antarctica, you have to bring everything with you, and it's an extremely difficult place to do research. I've not been there yet, but someday maybe I'll go. Penguins live in Antarctica and the coldest temperatures ever recorded on Earth are recorded in Antarctica, about minus 130 degrees Fahrenheit. And Antarctica does have some stations. There are places where scientists work, and the coldest records were from the Vostok station in Antarctica. And I think there's a picture of it. You can see it's a very bleak kind of place, and there's some living quarters. There's a place where they're drilling a well to drill down through the ice to investigate the ice. It's an extremely difficult place to hang out. It's dark all winter long for their winter, which is our summer, it's dark. Uh, but they do have Southern lights, the equivalent of our Northern lights. So if you lived in Antarctica in the winter time, you'd be able to see the Southern lights, but it is extremely cold and a very dangerous place. This is a view of the Vostok station from above. You can see there's not much there to see there's some long stripes. One of them is a runway because they're supplied by air. So all the material that comes to the Vostok station has to come by air. That's the runway. And we might pop over to McMurdo just to show where it is on the edge of the Antarctic um, landmass. The McMurdo station is one of the biggest stations in Antarctica. And I've known some people who've worked down there. And uh, some people from Denver go there because there's a staging point here in Denver where the logistics are organized to do research at McMurdo Sound, which is a, an occupied station uh, down in Antarctica. Uh, there it is. And you can see there's dormitories, there's research facilities, and not too many people spend the winter here, but sometimes they have to spend the winter. And it's a place where you'd wanna have a good supply of books to read, or maybe some YouTubes to watch. <laughs> Here's what McMurdo base looks like from above. 
You can see it's right near the ocean. They're supplied by sea. Uh, the boats can get into McMurdo. But this is one of the most extreme places on the face of the earth. Now, what we're going to do to end our show, we're getting near the end, but we're what we're going to do to end our show is we're going to leave the planet Earth and we're going to think about some extreme places up in space. And we'll talk about human influences in these extreme places. And many of you know we've been launching satellites uh, up to orbit the Earth. And we've also launched spacecraft out into space. And the spacecraft have gone extreme distances away from the Earth. They've been traveling for many, many years. And the Voyager spacecraft, there's two Voyager spacecraft. They're the ones that have gone the furthest from the planet Earth. And they've gone 15 billion miles. And the Earth has almost disappeared. There's a trace of the spacecraft. There's two of them. If we back out, we'll see the two uh, stripes that are heading out away from the planet Earth. And those are the Voyager, the traces of the Voyager spacecraft. And those are the two spacecraft that have gone the furthest from the planet Earth. And we can see their, their trajectory is a little bit kinked because they went next to planets like Jupiter. And when the spacecraft went next to Jupiter, it changed their orbital shape. The gravity of Jupiter changed their trajectory. And these two spacecraft have gone extremely far out into space, 15 billion miles. That's 15 with nine zeros, nine zeros. And let me ask another question. What do you think is the furthest that any human impact has gone out into space? And I'll let you think about it. The spacecraft have gone 15 billion miles but what else have we sent out into space on beyond Mars, way beyond Mars? And if you think about it, our radio and television signals have gone out into space and they're traveling at the speed of light. And our radio signals have been going out maybe for something about, uh, we could say maybe 90 years. And the signals of our radio and television transmissions can be seen. Let's see if we can get that sphere of the radio transmission, so-called radio sphere to show up. And it's going to be, it's going to look like a, a balloon. And there it is. It's coming in right into view right there. And we might, uh, Asa, let's see if we can just go in and find the earth and the sun and then back out from the earth and sun and see how big this thing is. This is the sphere of influence of our signal. So right in the middle of it will be the sun. Somewhere there will be the sun. If we can find the right star inside this sphere, right there, that's our sun. And of course, we're on a planet that's going around the sun on planet Earth. But our signals have gone way out into space. And they've gone about 90 million or 90 light years out into space. And those signals could be picked up by, if there was somebody out there listening, 80 to 90 light years away from Earth, they might be able to hear our signals. And we've been studying the nearby stars, and we've found planets around those stars. And each one of these blue dots, it looks sort of like a blue donut, each of those represent a planet that is in the system that has been reached by our radio signals. So if somebody was sitting on one of those planets, and they're called exoplanets, they're extremely far from Earth, but if somebody was sitting on one of those planets, listening carefully, they might be able to hear radio signals coming from the planet Earth, because our radio signals have traveled far out into space and have covered a huge area. You can see the volume covered by our radio signals. It looks very big, and of course it is big. It's 80 to 90 light years across in, in radius, actually. 80 to 90 light years, that's the amount of, a light year is the amount of distance that light can travel in a year and radio signals travel at the speed of light. So it's a huge sphere, extremely big. But I think Asa, if we back out a little bit, we'll see that in the scheme of things, it's actually pretty small. So we're gonna look out and see there's the sphere of our influence. There's all kinds of other planets outside of that sphere that haven't heard our signal yet. But if we keep backing out, you're going to see how it looks relative to our galaxy. 
And of course, we're in the Milky Way galaxy, and we're just that little tiny dot way over there. And here's our galaxy, a huge galaxy with hundreds of billions of stars, each of which maybe has planets. So there's hundreds of billions of planets in our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, and the Earth is in that little radio sphere. And what we might do, we're leaving, uh, we've got the Milky Way, what we might do to end our program, why don't we do this? Why don't we, we're gonna come back down and see if we can find the Denver Museum again. So we'll bring you home. We're sorry, we're out in space. We're gonna come down to the radio sphere, which is the impact of our radio signals across a little bit of our nearby space. And then we're gonna come in to our solar system and then we're going to come and see if we can find the earth and we'll see if we can bring you home to the denver museum and we'll have some time for questions and answers afterwards and you could pose them in the chat or you can shout them out uh, but we're going to be coming down and seeing if we can find ourselves and this is a tricky business ace is at the controls here and he's got to find the correct star which is hopefully in the middle of that sphere so that's a clue and it's got the Voyager spacecraft leaving it. You can see, the, again, the trajectories of the Voyagers. And then there's the planet Earth, maybe, orbiting around the sun. Let's see if we can find the planet Earth. Oh, my goodness. So we've got to get the right planet. If we landed on the wrong planet, we'd never find the museum. So we're going to see if we can find planet Earth. It's somewhere out here in space. Where are we? We might see the moon orbiting around it. Let's see if we can see that there. It's just coming into view. Do you guys see the planet Earth? It looks beautiful. Look how nice and hospitable it looks. It's beautiful blue. There it is. We're coming into planet Earth and you can recognize some features maybe. Do you guys see where we are? Do you recognize that continent? Yes, I can see some people are recognizing it. It's home and that's South America. Where is Denver? We've got, I see Cuba, I see the Yucatan Peninsula, I see Florida. Where is Denver? We've only got a couple more minutes. We better see if we can find Denver. Oh my goodness, it's dark. We got to wake up the planet. There it is. Aces, the sun has risen. We've got Southern California. We've got the Rocky Mountains. That sounds familiar. We've got the Arkansas River. That sounds familiar. We've got the front range. We're on familiar ground. We found the correct planet. Let's see if we can find our home on the correct planet. We've got the front range of Colorado. I see Chatfield Reservoir. Good heavens, we're getting close. Look at that. There's the South Platte River. And I can make out City Park. So we are coming into the right spot. There, that green rectangle is City Park. And remember that whitish building? on the right-hand side of City Park. That's where we started. We're gonna be coming down, right down onto the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And we're bringing you home. And we wanna thank you all for participating in our Digital Earth Academy. And we wanna invite you to our next Digital Earth Academy, which is gonna be on May 11. So if you like this one, come join us again on May 11 for our next Digital Earth Academy. And maybe we'll turn it over to Mitch and we'll see if there's any questions that come up from anybody in the audience. All right, that was awesome. Thank you for taking us all over the planet and way off into the universe. Um, we did get a lot of good questions. Some of you, if you need to leave at 1045, that's totally fine. We'll miss you, but uh, you have things to do. Um, if you can stick around, we have some questions. And this is a question that you're the perfect person to answer, Bob, because you actually have a pet yak. Um, someone asked if yaks on Mount Everest need oxygen. So the yaks, it's a very, that's a very interesting question. Uh, I traveled to, uh, I didn't go to Everest, but I went to Mount Kailas, which is a mountain that's very, it's relatively near Everest. And it's a beautiful mountain. And uh, you start out at the lower elevations. You, you actually have ponies that, that carry, help carry your baggage, little horses, and they're very rugged horses. But as you get to higher and higher altitudes, the ponies get exhausted. They don't really like it. And you turn over to yaks. And the yaks, they don't need oxygen. They're, they've evolved in, in Tibet. They're very happy up to about 18 or 19,000 feet. The yaks do just fine. If you go much above 19,000 feet, though, 
you don't take your yak with you anymore. You've got to carry the stuff on your back. So the yaks live in the Tibetan plateau area, but they only go up to about 19,000 feet. Very cool. <laughs> and how is your yak, by the way? The yak is doing very well. I, I, I gave it extra hay this morning. I've got a, an elderly yak and uh, we, I, I live in Longmont, which is right near Denver. And we had sort of a snowy morning and the yak asked for an extra bale of hay. So I gave the yak an extra bale of hay this morning. Well, okay, good. That's very nice. Um, also, about staying on Everest, is Mount Everest still growing? So good. That's a very good question. Uh, when I was studying Mount Everest, uh, there was a certain, there's an elevation that you can read. And, and you'll, if you look at Google, you'll get an elevation 29,000 plus feet high. But they have tried to survey the top of Mount Everest. It's extremely difficult to measure the exact top. The wind is super blowing hard up there. And uh, it is still growing because the subcontinent of India, the whole country of India is moving to the north at about the rate of that your hair grows. So it's, it's about five centimeters per year. That's about two to three inches per year. The whole Indian continent is moving north and that's pushing it's pushing the Himalaya mountains, making them continue to grow. So Mount Everest is continuing to grow, but it's also eroding. So you've got this competition between it's pushing it up and growing, and then the snow and the wind and the freezing and thawing is blowing and it's knocking it down. So it's a combination of forces active on the top of Mount Everest. Very cool. And we're getting a lot of questions about acids and how do they infect the environment? <clears throat> Kind of well, so, so, so I've seen acid places in Yellowstone, and uh, I have not been to that place in Dalol, Ethiopia, which is the most acidic of all, but I've been to some very acidic places in the Norris Geyser Basin in Yellowstone National Park, and if you go there, you'll see that the landscape has been turned white. And the rocks are crumbling because the acid is actually dissolving the rocks and the vegetation has been killed near the hot springs and the trees have sort of turned this white sort of powdery kind of material. So the acid is slowly dissolving both the trees and also actually dissolving the rocks in Yellowstone. Wow. But there are some organisms that need an acidic environment to live, right? No, absolutely. So, so Mitch is right, and, and you guys are right in the, in the uh, chat. I see that. There are certain animals and organisms that, that thrive in those acidic environments. And we found that life is extremely adaptable. So there's living organisms in hot springs. There's living organisms on the floors of the ocean. There's living organisms buried deep underground. Organisms, life is extraordinarily uh, flexible and extremely adaptable. And there's many very extreme conditions and places on earth and you go there and you find signs of life. And that's one of the reasons why we're exploring other planets like Mars right now. We're looking for signs of life on the planet Mars that might have grown in some of these similar kinds of extreme environments. Yeah, very cool, very cool. Now, we also had a lot of people wondering about Lake Magadi, that beautiful pink lake. Is that safe to touch? So when I was at Lake Magadi, of course, I wanted to get a sample and I did touch it. <laughs> and I brought home some samples of the salt crust at Lake Magadi. And uh, I did rinse my hand off afterwards, but it was, uh, it, it, it didn't, it felt a little uh, sort of slimy, but it, it didn't feel too bad. And uh, so it is safe to touch. I don't know if I'd go swimming in it unless you had a place that you could rinse yourself off, but it's, it is safe to touch Lake Magadi. Cool. And how about the Grand Prismatic Spring? Is that one safe to touch? Yeah. So, so when I went to the Grand Prismatic Spring, you walk along on that boardwalk and you're, you're supposed to not touch it <laughs> because if everybody touched it, it would sort of show the fingerprints of the people. But what I did do is I, I wanted to see how hot the water was. So I went near the Grand Prismatic Spring and I stuck my finger in the water just to see how hot it was. And I was, I stuck it in carefully. So uh, it was, it was, it was like, it was, it was like a hot bathtub water temperature where I was. And I wasn't, I didn't stick my finger snake in the middle of the grand prismatic. I don't think you can reach over that far, but when you're in the, when you're walking towards it, you can put your finger in the waters of the little streams that are near there. And uh, you got to do it very, very carefully because some of the water can be extremely hot. Uh, but the grand prismatic spring water where it was flowing out into the streams 
uh, was about like a hot bathtub. Nice, awesome. And uh, we have some questions about space. Do you feel ready for those? <laughs> well, we, we can, you know, we can try to answer questions. And if we don't have the answer, uh, we can have somebody Google it or we can give a rough estimate or let's see what the questions are. Uh, so the question is, what's in the middle of the Milky Way? We saw a really bright bulge in the middle of our galaxy. Yeah, so, so we've always wondered what's in the middle of the Milky Way. It's super hard to, to see it, but there have been very careful studies of the stars right in the middle of our Milky Way. And if you look closely at the stars in the middle of the Milky Way galaxy, you'll see that they're orbiting very rapidly around an object that we cannot quite make out what it is. And we believe that that object is a black hole. So we believe that there is a black hole in the central part of the Milky Way galaxy. And uh, it's a relatively small black hole. I'm getting, I'm getting strategic advice from my <laughs> partner, Kachun. And he's telling me that it's a relatively small black hole, only the size of our solar system. But nonetheless, we can detect that it's there by looking at the motion of the stars that are orbiting around it. Yeah, we shared that answer with everyone. That is uh, Dr. Cacunio who donated his tooth to be dissolved um, in acid. So thank you for that as well. <laughs> um, so what is the name of the volcano in Iceland that's erupting? Do you know that? So I, I did notice that question. And uh, those of you who have your Google open, you'll find the answer faster than I will. <laughs> and uh, I will tell you that I, I know a lot about the Icelandic naming systems. And uh, they can be complicated to say uh, by, by people that don't speak Icelandic. So somebody will put the name of that volcano uh, in the chat for you. <laughs> Wonderful. And follow up question, people are roasting hot dogs over the lava. How dangerous is that? How close can you get to lava? Well, so I've been right next to volcanoes that are erupting. And if you're far enough away from the center of the volcano where the crater is, which is spitting lava, you'll sometimes get to a place where the lava is just flowing, like a, literally like a river. And uh, you can get fairly close. You've got to be extraordinarily careful because it's extremely dangerous, uh, but you can get fairly close. And if you had a long stick with the hot dog on the end, you'd be able to reach that long stick over the place where the lava is flowing, and it would definitely roast it. And uh, I've had some of my college classmates were at a volcano in Guatemala a few years ago, and there was a lava flow that was moving. And it was, it was the entire lava flow. It had a big, dark black crust on it, but the whole thing was moving. And they climbed up on the moving lava flow, and they were the lava riders. And they said they did melt the bottoms of their boots a little bit. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that seems risky. Um, what would happen, do you think, if you put a tooth in lava? Well, you know, we do have actually fossils in lava, so they're rare. But if you go to Hawaii, you will see where, where lava has, has uh, flowed around trees, and you can see the cast of the tree. And then the most famous fossil in lava is in uh, Washington State, and it is extremely famous. It's one of the most famous fossils in the United States, and it's a fossilized rhinoceros and a lava flow came across this rhinoceros. The rhinoceros was eating flowers down by a stream and the lava flow came from behind and the rhinoceros was feeling very strong and it didn't think that it was gonna be bothered by a lava flow and it was eating flowers right next to the stream and the lava flow came faster and faster and actually engulfed the whole rhinoceros and the rhinoceros was, was inside the lava flow and it got baked in the lava flow and then many, many, many years later, there was a big flood in Washington state and it flooded, it washed across and eroded the edge of the lava flow. And it made a little hole near the rear end of this rhinoceros. And you can crawl in this cave and you're inside where there used to be a rhinoceros. And when they first got there, they found bones on the floor of the cave. And when you go there today, you can reach around and you can feel where there's a nose and there's a horn and there's a leg and there's a belly button. You can feel all the details of the rhinoceros when you're inside it. So 
That's an example of a fossil in a lava flow. If you put a tooth in the lava flow, the same thing might happen. The tooth might, might dissolve, but you might have the cavity. It would be the exact same shape as the tooth. Wow, that's wild. <laughs> um, so when volcanoes erupt, what, what happens? How does a volcano erupt? Well, that's, that is a very interesting question. So, you know, there's lots of volcanoes around the world, and many of them are what we call dormant, meaning they're asleep. And when we say a volcano is dormant, we say that because we, we mean that it can erupt. And why a volcano erupts is still something that people are discussing. And it certainly has to do with the pressure from below. It has to do with melting magma that rises towards the surface and breaks through to the surface. But exactly why a volcano erupts is, is still a little bit of a mystery. We understand a lot about the process, but if you asked us to predict, for example, where the next volcano is going to erupt in Iceland, or when Mount St. Helens might erupt again, or when there might be a volcanic eruption in Yellowstone, right now, geologists can tell you that it will happen sometime in the future, but we do not have the ability to predict exactly when it will happen. And so the question about when and why those are difficult questions and we're still working on it. So we understand a lot about volcanoes, but to predict exactly when they're going to erupt, that remains one of the great challenges for geologists today. And we're working on it right now. And we need help. We need young people to become scientists and work on these kinds of questions. Here's Mount Kilimanjaro, for example, in Kenya. It's right on the border. It's actually physically in Tanzania. They've made a little kink in the border. And Lots of people would love to know when Mount Kilimanjaro is going to erupt again, and we do not know the answer to that. We know that it will erupt someday. We can see the crater. We can see it's got uh, hot springs up at the top, but we do not know when it will next erupt. Wow. What a cool volcano. Um, so you mentioned there's magma under the surface of the earth. How deep do you have to dig before you get magma? Well, if you think about it, if I took you to Iceland and asked you how far you had to dig, you'd say, well, you don't need to dig very far because you can see the magma is coming out on the surface. Same thing's true in Hawaii. Some of you might have seen some pictures of the, of the lava flows in Hawaii. I'm, I'm being attacked by my dog here. This is, this, this, is, this is Hoppy who's come up to see us here. He loves to zoom. So, <laughs> so, so uh, the in, if you went to Hawaii or uh, uh, Iceland, you don't need to go very far at all. If you went to Yellowstone, where we know that there's magma at depth, you'd have to go down uh, about a mile. So if you drilled a hole about a mile deep in Yellowstone, we think you'd start to get close to hot magma. And, and Hoppy's very excited to hear that. This is, there's Hoppy right there. He's, he loves the concept of going to Yellowstone and drilling. If you came to Colorado, and if I asked you to drill down to magma, you'd have to drill down many miles. So in Colorado, you'd have to go down 25 or 30 miles before you got to what we might call magma. Wow. And what happens if a volcano erupts near an ocean or a lake? What happens when the lava hits the water? Well, we've seen that happen in Hawaii. That when, the, when the magma hits the water, there's a huge steam clouds come up and uh, the magma breaks up into little pieces uh, and, and it shatters. And um, if, you, if it erupts under the water, for example, on the bottom of the seafloor, where there are lots of volcanoes, it makes uh, things that we call pillows, and they're like the trunks of elephants. And it comes out, I've seen movies of it on the floor of the ocean, it comes out like trunks of elephants, one on top of another. And when you see it in rock outcrops, they look like pillows, and we actually call it pillow lava. So very distinctive. Very cool. All right, we're just about at the end of our time. Uh, people want you to know that your dog is cute. Um, <laughs> and do you have any final thoughts for us? Yeah, I mean, I mean, Hoppy is an extremely interesting dog. He's only got three legs. And uh, we got him as an adopted dog, and he's missing a front leg. And he runs just like the other dogs. He doesn't even know he's missing it. So he's an extremely uh, adaptable doggy. And uh, he says hello to everybody. So Hoppy says hello. And uh, he's, he's very happy sitting right here next to me, zooming. He loves zooming. Hoppy? And uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, if you want to see this 
Uh, again, or any of our videos, again, you can look at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science YouTube channel, um, and you can watch some of our past presentations as well. It's very fun. And we hope that you'll join us next month for our Digital Earth Academy Oceans. And what day is that again? Uh, our next Digital Earth Academy is on May 11th. May 11th. We hope to see you again. And thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs>